education. The state of American public education is one big disaster. We had a teacher put a kid's head in a toilet. Parents are not going to sit back and take this anymore. We've got to change the system, and we've got to put the parents in charge. The dam is getting ready to break, and it's going to overwhelm the country. Hi, I'm Larry Elder, and this is the National Desk. My current assignment, education in America. For the next hour, we'll examine the state of our public schools and focus on efforts to change what some believe is an unsalvageable government system. We'll look at charter schools, private scholarships, and the most controversial proposal, vouchers. Not one day goes by in America that there isn't some conflict brewing over our public schools. The excuse that the principal gives to discuss So, what is all this anger about? Oh, I understand it, because this is a very personal subject for me. I, like many of you, spent 12 years in the public schools, from 74th Street Elementary to inner city Crenshaw High in South Central Los Angeles. My parents and I thought I was getting a good education, until one day I was sent to the primarily white middle class Fairfax High School for a few courses not offered at Crenshaw. It was a rude awakening. Larry came in from school and he said, Mama, I got a problem. I, I said, what kind of problem you have? I'm not going to be, ma I'm going to be making C's and D's at Fairfax. And I've been, I said, you've been making A's and B's all along. He said, but the standards there are so much higher than they are in our school. I still was confused because in my mind, I thought one high school was just the same as another high school. And all of a sudden, tears just came down his cheek and he was crying. And he said, something's got to be done. The perception that he was so far behind really sort of devastated him. He went to the library, he checked out books, he studied hard, and he started to catch up on some of the stuff that he had missed. The discovery that my parents and I made has been repeated in other families thousands of times across this country. The system has let many of us down. Some of us have recovered, but others have not. The debate in America about our public education system has seen increasing intensity for the last 40 years. The stakes are high, especially when it's you or your child for whom the system isn't working. Also, the stakes are high because public education is big business. America spends nearly $300 billion each year on K-12 education, over 20 times the annual revenue of Microsoft. There are nearly 6 million people employed in the public schools. Only half of these are actually classroom teachers. The others range from administrators to custodians. All are engaged in the education of some 47 million children. So, with this enormous amount of money and effort, where are we today with our public school system? For those who say that public education is just fine, thank you, ma'am, they're wrong. But we do a terrific job given the very complex set of needs and demands that our children bring to us and that our school systems have. In most places, uh, public schools are doing very well. Uh, as a matter of fact, we have seen uh, positive trends over the last few months uh, in uh, test results and in other measures that have been used to uh, measure the quality of public education. Having said that, there are places in this country, in individual schools or districts, where we have troubled schools and, and we have low-performing schools. And it's our responsibility as an organization, as well as the community's responsibility, to do what's necessary to improve these schools. Sounds reasonable. Others paint a far more dire picture. Your opinion, the state of American public education. The state of American public education is one big disaster. Young people apply for jobs. They can't read. They can't do arithmetic. They are functional, semi-illiterates with graduation certificates. Across the board, math, science, and other areas, American students are, are not learning enough. They're not challenged enough. 
Public education has been in serious decline in the United States over the last several decades. Uh, we have gone from having the greatest educational system in the world to one that really is an embarrassment compared to almost every other industrialized nation. The current state of education in the United States is very worrisome to a number of people who have studied it, particularly in an international context. Our students do reasonably well in the early uh, elementary school, but they fall increasingly behind during the years in middle school and high school, so that by the end, American students are near the bottom of the international rankings. Many businesses are experiencing in, in their recruiting, uh, they're getting people coming to the companies that they have to retrain because they lack basic skills, whether it's in math or communication. And that's costly, but they're doing it because they think it's important. and. Uh, you know, they'd probably do less of it if the, if the public schools were, were doing a better job. After comparing literacy rates in eight different countries, American 16 to 25 year olds scored near the bottom. They had only the most rudimentary grasp of reading and writing and could never really hold a job that required literacy. I guess I would describe the current state of our public schools in one word as mediocre and going the wrong direction. We have a higher level of illiteracy today than we had 100 years ago. That is a terrible indictment of our government school system. While the general state of education is not where it should be, it's in critical condition in the inner city, where education may be someone's only escape from poverty and crime. But it hasn't always been this way. A hundred years ago, in Washington, D.C., 1899, there were four high schools. There were three white, one black. That year, they gave standardized tests in all the schools. The black high school came in ahead of two of the three white high schools. A hundred years later, it would be considered utopian even to hope for that. Now, what has happened in between? They were segregated. The black schools were starved for money and continued to be on for the decades to come. Today, in Washington, D.C., they have one of the highest, if not the highest, expenditure per pupil in the country. And the results are miserable. The problems and the complexities of urban America are extreme. And they are ones where it is very tough for all children in all schools to be healthy and to succeed. And it's those kids, not surprisingly, that the system fails most abysmally because they are captive. They have nowhere else to go. And so the system is focused not toward serving the needs of the kids, but serving the needs of the unions and other special interest groups. They're not challenging the children. They don't really believe that the children can learn, so they don't even try. A teacher who's really bad, I don't just mean inadequate, we're talking bad, uh, and she's in some middle class school. She gets sent down the food chain to some school that is not middle class, and many of them end up in low income and minority neighborhoods where they absolutely destroy uh, any possibility in life for the kids there. And this is done because the middle class people have more clout, they either know people, have influence, or they know how to present their case in such a way that it's likely to get some results. And so the people who are the most vulnerable, who most need a good education, get stuck with these, these teachers. This practice of simply sending bad teachers elsewhere is so widespread that there's a name for it. It's called uh, the turkey trot or the dance of the lemons. So it's a, everyone knows this goes on, even though they all pretend that they don't know. When we have critical failures in our ability to deliver an essential service like education, some people are beginning to ask if the problem is the system itself. And this has led to a chorus of voices advocating a shift of power from the entrenched educational establishment to parents, like it was in the beginning. For much of our history, education was considered the responsibility of parents in the local community. Teachers were accountable to the parents who paid them. As communities grew, competition between schools kept tuition down. By 1850, the overwhelming majority of children attended elementary school and literacy was high. Yet some critics accused the schools of being unprofessional and not uniformly accessible to the poor. The leading exponent of this criticism was education reformer Horace Mann of Massachusetts. He was elected to lead the country's first state board of education in 1837. And over the next decade, he campaigned vigorously for centrally planned and completely tax-funded public schools. Such a system, he promised, would end disparities between rich and poor forge harmonious communities, and even end crime and vice. Horace Mann's public school system was implemented during the last half of the 19th century. At first, little effect was felt because local control still dominated. But as the years passed, this was to change. First, the number of school districts was reduced gradually 
so that today we have less than 10% of the 150,000 existing early in the 20th century, shifting control from parents to public school professionals. Furthermore, the relationship between the two changed when the powerful National Education Association, over 100 years after it was formed, became a full-fledged union following the example of the American Federation of Teachers. And last, the influence of the federal government increased when the Department of Education was formed in 1979. The promises made by Horace Mann have simply not been fulfilled. Far from being a source of community harmony, public schools have set neighbor against neighbor throughout their entire history, with school wars erupting over everything from textbook censorship to bilingual education. Today, nearly a quarter of young Americans are functionally illiterate, according to an international literacy study. And no one would suggest that the system has ended crime and vice in society. We haven't even been able to eliminate them in the public schools. And perhaps most disappointing, the disparity between the quality of education received by poor and wealthy children today is larger than it has ever been. For all these reasons, a growing number of people are beginning to question the very concept of a centralized, government-run educational system that was, after all, the result of a reform movement of the 1800s. The centralization of education has been uh, a problem. That is, back in the, in the uh, 50, early 50s, uh, there were many, many school districts, and there's been a lot of consolidation. And so what that means is that there's a lot of control that's lost at the, at the local level. In virtually every community, in every state in the country, it is a monolithic organization. Uh, it is a top-heavy bureaucracy and a top-heavy monopoly. The public system is not a monopoly for people who are affluent. Uh, if you have enough money, you can move to uh, whatever community has the kind of public schools you want, or you can uh, send your child to a private school. The system really is a monopoly, though, for people at the bottom end of the economic ladder, uh, where they don't have money to move to a different neighborhood or to send their kids to private schools. And if we have only one monolithic school system that has a uniform curriculum throughout an entire district, sometimes very similar curriculum throughout an entire state, you eliminate the kind of choices that parents need in order to get the things they want for their children. Right now, the public schools enroll 89, 90% of the pupils in this country. You know, uh, when you have that share of the market in any other field, it wouldn't even be close whether you had a monopoly or not. Webster's Dictionary defines a monopoly as the exclusive control by one group of the means of producing or selling a service. Is that what we have with our public school system? People have to consider that there is no such thing as a national public school system. There are, in fact, 15,000-plus school systems in this country, all of which are individually governed by locally elected school boards. Uh, so to say the public school system and put everybody into that, that uh, category is really incorrect from my perspective. When the NEA was a professional association rather than a union, when in the 1920s there were 150,000 school districts, you did not have a monopoly in schools. But you have a monopoly now by reason of the pervasive influence of the teachers' unions throughout the country. In some ways I have to laugh because I think of the 296 school districts in my state, um, and I don't think of myself as running a monopoly as state superintendent. Each one of those districts has its own viewpoint on the world, its own locally elected school board. The monopoly of the public school system doesn't depend upon how many outlets the monopoly has. I used to work for AT&T when it was the world's largest monopoly, and we had outlets from coast to coast, uh, you know. So the number of outlets tells you absolutely nothing about that, if they're all controlled from the same place. And by this time, we know what the outcomes of monopoly are. Lack of progress, lack of technical innovation. Uh, doesn't matter what you do, you get paid the same. All the evils that we generally associate with monopolies are associated with public education now. Whether or not everyone calls it a monopoly, it is certainly true that almost every parent in America is served by only one local public school system. In most cases, schools are assigned, not chosen. And parents and the community are required to pay through taxation, even if they're not satisfied with their schools. Sounds like a monopoly to me.
As a result, many parents simply feel disconnected in terms of what they need for their children's education and how and when the system responds. So I talked to one mother, and she said she was concerned about the, uh, her child, I think it was her son's uh, reading progress or lack of it. She wanted to go and talk to the classroom teacher. Well, the classroom teacher stopped her at the door and said, you know what, can't do it right now. You should go down to the office. So she talked to somebody in the academic area in the office, and they said you should sit down and talk to the vice principal. She talked to the vice principal. She said, you've got some very interesting points. You ought to come to the PTA meeting and really bring those up. We meet in two weeks. You could come and you could make a statement. And she said to me, you know what? I wanted to talk to the teacher about what was going on with my son's reading. I didn't want to go and stand up and speak at a PTA meeting in two weeks' time. She felt that she had been nicely guided by the elbow further and further away from the classroom. The school board in all communities are elected representatives of the community and of the parents. Um, if the parents are dissatisfied with the school board members, with the policies they adopt, they throw them out of office at the next election. That's really the way in which they get their input into things. It separates out the control of the system from parents and, and puts it in the hands of a very indirect elected and appointed set of experts that really are not directly answerable to parents. And so if the parents find that the schools are not serving their needs, if they find that they want to reform the public school system, they have no direct avenue to make the changes they want happen. They have to try to lobby government officials, and the mechanism is so cumbersome that shifts very rarely take place. It's not something that, that happens today or, or tomorrow, but it's certainly something that is happening now in a whole host of places around the country because proven education reform methods are being implemented. Public school reformers are talking about improving things in a three-year, a five-year period, a 10-year plan to move up, close gaps, and so on and so forth. And you talk to the parents, and they're dealing with the child for whom that period would be from first grade to 10th grade, that 10-year span. And knowing that, as they see up and down their block and as they know with their nieces and nephews, that kids are dropping out of school, 50% of the kids are dropping out of school from 9th grade to 12th grade. They don't have three years to wait, five years to wait, 10 years to wait. They don't want their children to be a guinea pig for that period in time. And so their sense of urgency is dramatic. The biggest uh, fault, if I can say, of the public system is that um, it doesn't deal in the here and now. It deals in policies and procedures and bureaucratic noise, and it forgets that people live today and, and need relief and education and support today. Economists tell us that the first casualty of monopoly is accountability to the consumers. Is this the case in our public schools? What public education has done is create a group of people who are insulated from being fired, from being seriously disciplined, and allow them to indulge themselves in whatever fads come along in utter disregard of the interests of the children that they are teaching. Where there is no accountability for results, and no penalties for poor performance, and no rewards for outstanding performance, um, then you really can't expect the system to move in any particular direction. We are not in the, in the business of protecting bad teachers, and that should be clear. Uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, we've uh, um, embraced um, the concept of peer assistance and review that has to be obviously negotiated locally. Their supervision mechanisms and processes ought to kick into place and say, you're out of here. You're out. Thank you very much, but your services are not good enough to be able to teach my children. We have no problems with that as long as the system is fair and just. That's the question. That's the question that has to be answered. There is no one in this country who believes that somebody should not be guaranteed due process. Their official position is their role is not to defend the incompetent, but it's to protect the procedural rights of teachers. If they really meant that, they could streamline the procedures so the teachers still got due process, but you didn't have all these ridiculous hurdles, so that if the teacher is observed for 29 minutes instead of 30, then the union say, well, you didn't follow the procedure and therefore you, which is the kind of thing that goes on now. We had a teacher put a kid's head in a toilet, a soil toilet, on purpose. And while the, 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 the board, I mean the superintendent at the time, really wanted to fire the person, ultimately the, the board agreed to one year 
a suspension, but then an arbitrator, because we have binding arbitration in, in Wisconsin, forced us to not only put this, this person back into the school district, but to pay him six months' wages and put him back in the very school where this incident occurred. Now, when those kind of things happen, it puts a chill on anybody who's going to really go after incompetent people. Because in the end, what you feel is, by the time you go through the process, you know, you're going to run up against um, a, a situation where people will be put back into the school district and in some ways more powerful than they were when they left because it sort of proves that you really can't do anything to us. The difficulty of getting rid of teachers is such that in... Uh as of the time I wrote that book, it cost tens of thousands of dollars to fire one teacher. Since then, that number has risen to over $100,000. As a result of such experiences, some, frustrated that the schools are not responsive, say that the system just isn't willing to reform. People say the public schools, complaining about the public schools, especially urban public schools, will say they have to reform and they're not doing anything. That is very much wrong. They are reforming constantly. They have three, four, five different major reform initiatives going at any point in time. Now, uh, urban superintendents often uh, stay in a system only two years, maybe three years, 18 months. Each one comes in with a new multi-point reform. Out go the old reforms, in come the new. We have, the problem is that we have just rolling reforms. And unfortunately, what tends to happen is that if you do find a community where the parents are very organized and they manage to make some reform to their school system at the district or even at the state level, their changes tend to be transitory. Sooner or later, a new superintendent of public instruction comes in, a new district superintendent comes in, and the hard-won victory of that community group uh, is eventually lost. All I know is what I'm trying to do in Washington. I have four years. I'm going to run again. I hope I'll have another four years so that I can sustain this for a period of time. There is the reform du jour. Uh, teachers are disgusted with the fact that this year, there's one reform, and they have to turn themselves inside out. And they've learned if they just wait, it'll go away. I don't believe that there's anything that the, that the educational establishment can do within itself to improve public education in the United States. Dr. Howard Fuller, a longtime choice advocate, had the unique opportunity of becoming superintendent of Milwaukee Public Schools. During his term, he and his team tried to implement numerous changes from within the system. Even though there's certain things that you believe and other people believe that ought to be done, you can't necessarily get it done. There, there are union contracts in the, that, that say this is how it has to be done. There are federal rules and regulations. There are state guidelines. There are board mandates. There's past practice. There's arbitration. So what happens is you, you, you finally see that no matter how hard you push inside, the resistance, the inertia, the, the non dimatism of, of the system is always pushing against you. And so I concluded, and I believe that this is right, that even if you have people inside the system, and we have many people inside the Milwaukee public school system who want to do the right things by kids, unless you have an outside pressure, unless these parents have other options, I just don't think it can be done. So what is the answer? What is this outside force necessary to enable the system to change. If we're gonna get an improvement in school, we have to have competition. And competition means people who are trying to satisfy the customer. Who are the customers? They're the parents and the children. There's a lot of competition on the college level between private universities and public universities. And maybe it's not a mistake or it's not, it's not happenstance that the United States college system is the envy of the world. In my research, what I tried to do was compare different school systems from all over the world and from throughout history and look for the ones that did the best job of serving families. And I did find a consistent trend that competitive markets really did do a better job of serving the public 
than other school systems, and in particular, better than state-run school systems such as we have today. The notion that one size fits all doesn't really work anywhere, and it works perhaps least well in the educational system, where each child has different uh, talents, each child has a different background. The notion that every child should be educated in the same way or the same place really defeats the purpose of public education. Some say that the only way to provide competition in education is to utilize the forces of free enterprise, where many different kinds of providers offer their services to meet the variety of needs. Let's now take a look at three forms of competition being talked about today, charter schools, private scholarships, and vouchers. First, charter schools provides for an alternative within the public education system. A charter school is essentially an independent public school. Uh, it's a school that is paid for by the taxpayers, that is open to all students without any admissions requirements. The schools are subject to continuous review, and if they aren't performing uh, and meeting the goals that they have explicitly set forth in their charters, they can be closed. And that doesn't happen in the traditional public education environment. It is uh, governed by a group of citizens, uh, chartered typically by a state, or sometimes chartered by uh, a state university or sometimes even by a local school district, but it's a governing authority that is separate from the traditional local school district structure. It's just about a 10-year-old movement that has really picked up, uh, picked up speed in the last few years quite dramatically across the states. There are a little over 1,400 charter schools now open around the country providing education from kindergarten through 12th grade. To take a closer look, we visited the Boston Renaissance Charter School, the largest charter school in the country, unique also because it's run by the Edison Project, a for-profit education management company. The Boston Renaissance School was actually one of the first charter schools in America, and it is the largest charter school in America. Uh, it was um, created in the state of Massachusetts uh, in 1995 through a partnership between the Edison Project uh, and the Boston Renaissance Charter School Board, a group of prominent citizens within Boston that had always wanted to provide a terrific public school within the city of Boston. If there is um, a higher number of children applying to the school than space allows for, then they go into a blind lottery. It's, we do not pick and choose the children who come here. In public school, I got away with a lot of stuff being bad. But here, you don't get away with nothing. It was different because of the work. The work here was better, it was harder, and I was learning more. At the public school, they didn't like take time and help you like these teachers would. They would just go on with the lesson. Even if the kids didn't understand it, they will just keep on going on. With charter schools, there are no unions necessarily present. A school could become unionized um, after it's up and operating, but our charter schools are not uh, union schools. It seemed almost treacherous to be leaving the public school to come to a charter school because of my my union affiliation and how they felt about charter schools and so forth. But then I had to look at my children's future and I thought that that was more important than any other allegiance that I might have. Sometimes people depend too much on the union and the whole idea of teaching in the classroom kind of gets lost. Where here you're concentrating more on teaching. There isn't that, that union back there making decisions. Um, sometimes you just want to let something go. Um, and when there's a union, you don't let anything go. It's a wonderful opportunity um, to be involved in a new form of education. Um, it's nice to have the support of many other teachers and administration. So I, I find it a very wonderful job and a great opportunity for the children. I recommend the school to anyone I mean, anyone who has a goal in life. I think charters represent a great hope for an immediate solution uh, and a great step in the right direction of trying to solve the problem of urban American uh, education. There are now nearly 40 states that have adopted charter laws. Upwards of 350,000 students attended well over 1,500 charter schools in 1999. And the president has set a goal of 3,000 charter schools by early in the 21st century. But in spite of this progress, and although charter schools have been successful at achieving competition within the system, critics warn that the benefits won't last. Charter schools are sort of a halfway house towards 
complete choice. You, you have a choice there only within the public school system and only with a limited number of schools that are freed from the crippling uh, red tape and bureaucracy. I do think that charter schools improve, um, improve upon the public system that we have today. Um, however, they have many shortcomings from the standpoint of limiting competition, of being answerable to charter approving boards rather than strictly to parents. Um, they, again, sever the link between payment and consumption uh, so that the way that they would increase their funding is to lobby the government rather than lobbying their customers. Charter schools, for instance, increase the freedom of public schools in the short term, but eventually would be re-regulated to the point of acting more like public schools. Another mechanism for escaping failing schools? Private scholarships. Funded by philanthropists unwilling to wait for a political solution, this movement is growing. One of the largest organizations is CEO America, which has some 30 active groups around the country. CEO America, which stands for Children's Educational Opportunity Foundation, is an organization that is dedicated to promoting expanded parental choice in education through private philanthropy. My aunt called me because she heard about the scholarship fund because she knew I wanted to send Deshaun to private school and I wouldn't be able to until I got out of school financially. So she called me, she gave me the 1-800 number. I called and gave them all the information over the phone and I received a packet in the mail and I filled it out and returned it. This level of choice, unencumbered with a lot of regulations, with a lot of restrictions, is really the sort of thing that history shows is going to serve those families um, most effectively. It was probably about two months and I received a letter in the mail saying, Congratulations, you were one of the chosen families. If people at the bottom of the economic ladder are willing to put their own money into ed and they have to, by the way, that's one of the conditions. If they are willing to put their own money and pass up a free service, what does that say about the quality of the free service? So they're going to pay 50% of Deshaun's schooling, however much the schooling is for that year. That makes the parent a, a party to the plan, uh, that it, it, the parent does not see it as free. And uh, anytime people see things as free, not costing them anything, they're not likely to use it as uh, well as they otherwise would. These private scholarships are often the only chance for saving the lives of young people at risk in our inner cities. One day I came home and the police had him handcuffed to the porch and it just absolutely tore me apart. And I just envisioned him being in jail, being in prison, being dead. The good news is that the, four, the, the $200 million plus was used to fund 40,000 plus scholarships. The bad news is 1.25 million families applied for those scholarships. I mean, I remember sitting on the front porch thinking, what am I gonna do with this child? And this neighbor of mine just came by and said, are you okay? I mean, I was in tears. and I mean, I was scared to death. I didn't know where we were gonna go from here. And we talked and he said, uh, well, maybe I can help. It just begins to fill the, the tremendous need for that kind of, of uh, assistance to parents in order to give them more educational opportunity for themselves and for their children. And a couple of weeks later, this, same, this young neighbor came by and said, I have gotten eight guys that are my fraternity brothers to agree to contribute to sending William to whatever private school you choose. For the philanthropists, the businesses who have invested in private scholarships, there is no better investment they could make. For every child who's getting those scholarships, it could mean the difference between a decent education and no education at all. We had difficulty for a long time with, pub with traditional public school system. And I never heard him talk about college. I mean, I heard him talk about getting a job after he got out of high school, but now I hear him, his world has kind of opened up. He, he starts talking about college. This is a wonderful movement. I applaud those who are involved in it, and I think they're gonna see a, a real nice return. And here's what the NEA thinks about private scholarships. We have not come out hard and fast against private vouchers, but I think they raise some very important issues. And for example, uh, Ted Forsman, when he was on uh, Oprah Winfrey's show, uh, talking about uh, the uh, event that was going to occur in March or April of this year, where they announced uh, many voucher, private vouchers or scholarships, uh, indicated that this program would be a four-year program. 
And after that, if people wanted to continue on with this program, that it would have to be with public dollars. That raises questions in my mind. In addition to private scholarships, many believe that the best way to introduce competition and put power in the hands of parents is to adopt a universal voucher system, an idea first proposed in the 50s by Nobel Prize winning economist Milton Friedman in his book, Capitalism and Freedom. The idea is this, we as taxpayers pay into state and local government to fund education. Normally, the money allocated for each child then goes directly to the public schools. In a voucher system, however, a portion of that money would be given to the child's parents in the form of a voucher, which they can then spend at any school they choose. Professor, your opinion of vouchers? I believe that the universal voucher system is the only feasible device for introducing effective competition in schooling. What's important about the vouchers is that it will open the door to the entry of entrepreneurs into the schooling industry. There is a need to give families more control, but there's really only one really effective way to do that, and that's to provide families or students with vouchers so that they can take that voucher and use it at a school of their choice. Any other way of trying to give more power to families is is not going to work. A voucher system, uh, a school choice system, is one where uh, the public is providing for the child's education, but the parent is deciding where that education will take place. In other words, it transforms the, the most basic concern of public education from where a child is being educated to whether a child is being educated. And so a parent can choose among a range of options uh, in the public schools or in the private schools. It's essentially exactly the way the GI Bill or Pell Grants work at the post-secondary educational system, and that is uh, the money is for the child's education and it follows the child wherever that child goes as long as an education is taking place. Although the concept of public vouchers has been around since the 50s, it had never been implemented. But that all changed when the tornado of discontent with public education reached critical mass and touched ground in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Education here in Milwaukee back in 1990-91 was horrendous. You had a public school system that was approximately 100,000 students, and of that number, more than 50% dropped out of the students who did graduate from high school in four or five years, the average grade was a D plus. And that was for the system. When you broke it down by ethnic groups, as an example for African American males, it took 10 for every one to graduate. We had uh, court ordered busing just like Cleveland or Boston or Detroit or other cities. And we had uh, uh, people with money and kids fleeing leaving town, people that had resources. The quality of education under desegregation had actually deteriorated. So in, in, in an ironic twist, we were actually better off in these segregated, dilapidated buildings than we were under this process. We started out trying to figure out ways to get the system to respond to our concerns. And when that did not happen, then the issue of choice was put on the table. Low-income black parents who did not approve of the quality education, who were upset by the quality, frustrated by their attempts to get quality education, felt that it was better to have their kids go to black private schools or Catholic schools. So what they did was they sought and pushed for a voucher program to enable them to send their kids to private schools. It focused on the issue of parental choice, parents being able to choose high quality education for their children, uh, choose the school they wanted for their child, and still live in the city. Many inner cities in the United States had the same problem with the public schools. Milwaukee was unique because of a few individuals who understood how to use political power, individuals who, regardless of political party affiliation, came together to create dynamic change. The key event right up front was the uh, persistence, the will, the organizing ability of uh, Representative Annette Polly Williams. Uh, her, her own children had been uh, assigned to a school against her will, and she didn't want her daughter to go there. She stood up to uh, the school system, demanded that her daughter not be in that school, and uh, she started the move towards school choice. From 1980 to 1990, I was introducing legislation to empower 
parents in the public schools. I mean, I, I, I was doing all kinds of things. And I would get slapped down. And, but I would come back. So we just proceeded to organize then uh, to get a bill passed. It was strictly low-income families in the community with these community schools that are already there, um, pulled together, and we just, at my office, and we did a lot of the flyers. And then the parents would took the flyers and went to the beauty shops, the barber shop. They start telling their own the neighbors about this, this opportunity that we get this bill passed, we'll be able to have a choice. I've never seen the groundswell of public support, of enthusiasm, of keen interest by black people for any campaign as I've seen for school choice. At the time of the vote, we, we got um, busloads, got a busload of people to come up there. And uh, they was up in the galleries. When we went up to Madison on the day they voted, I mean, it became a prayer vigil. I mean, <laughs> imagine that. These poor, low-income parents are actually out in the hallways praying. One of the Democrats who went ahead and voted for it, even though they didn't want to, they said, well, there's no way I can vote no and look it up there in the galleries and saw all my constituents there. And we were able to get 60-some votes. You know, that and we needed 50. But we were able to get 60s uh, to get the bill passed. It was able to get to the governor's office. He signed it into law. And then we have a Milwaukee Parental Choice Program. And the euphoria that when they passed this bill, you know, it was like, I called it our second emancipation proclamation. And the idea and the intent of that legislation was always to empower the parents, the low-income families. It's to bring the power that was right now in the hands of bureaucrats who made decisions based on the needs of maintaining a system rather than make a decision based on the needs of that child. The opposition, recognizing the importance of the voucher movement in Milwaukee, imported their best legal guns and dug in for a lengthy battle. Our objective as lawyers for the NEA is to strike down what we think is a bad program. So we will go after it on the basis of church-state separation, we will go after it on any other provision in a state constitution. We will go after it on a procedural defect in the enactment of the program. So we've had to fight court battle after court battle, David versus Goliath in every single instance. This dates back now to 1990 and the initial Milwaukee Parental Choice Program, which was restricted to only a thousand kids and non-sectarian schools. We had to fight that out for three solid years all the way up to the Wisconsin Supreme Court. The size of the voucher movement may be small right now, but that doesn't mean that it's not going to grow. The education establishment has fought against every parental choice program, no matter how tiny that program was, as if its own existence depended upon it. And you know what? They're right. One of the primary arguments used in court revolved around the use of public funds. The NEA's policy, Representative Assembly policy, is categorically opposed to the use of public money to fund private education. I thought it was my money. I thought it was these parents' money. I thought it was our tax dollars who went to the state and is now following our kids. So it's their money? That tells you something about their whole mindset. It's their money? We're stealing money from them? It's our money. Should parents have the option to make choices uh, uh, within the private school sector and have public dollars follow the students to those private schools, my response to that is no. The state can provide the money. That doesn't mean it has to run it. The state pays for food stamps, but it doesn't run the groceries in which the food stamps are spent. There are many people who argue that you can't do public vouchers because it's taxpayer dollars. Well, persons who are paying taxes and not getting the benefit for which they are paying have a right and the government has a responsibility to find a way to get their resources back to them uh, to provide for the basic services that government has promised them. In spite of strong opposition, voucher proponents were victorious in the courts, and the first voucher students started at the schools of their choosing in 1990. Five years later, after continuous assault from the unions, the NAACP, People for the American Way, and others, the grassroots movement led by Pauli Williams succeeded in having parental choice broadened through the inclusion of religious schools. And as a result, the battle again was taken up. So the biggest single attack 
on these programs is they take my money as a taxpayer and they give it to someone to use to pay for religious education, worship, indoctrination, and other religious activities. I firmly believe, as a lawyer and as a taxpayer, that that is wrong. The opponents of school choice say that the moment a dollar of public funds crosses the threshold of a religious school that it violates the Constitution. That's absurd. If that were the case, the GI Bill, Pell Grants, daycare vouchers would all be unconstitutional. Fortunately, the U.S. Supreme Court has said over and over again that so long as religious schools are only one of the options that are available and parents are choosing where to spend those dollars, those kinds of programs are totally valid. The National School Boards Association is involved in several of those Supreme Court cases around uh, using public money vouchers for religious and private schools. Uh, we believe it's unconstitutional. We will continue to um, support the, uh, in the state of Florida. We are now a co-counsel in the case against Bush and the Florida law. Um, we think it's illegal. I'm a Vietnam vet. When I got back from Vietnam, they gave me a GI Bill, said I can go to school any place I wanted. I could have went to Marquette. Last time I checked, that's a Catholic school. Or I could go to UWM, which is not a Catholic school. That was the same so-called public money. It's not a question of being anti-religious. It's a question of, of the law being the law and of not promoting uh, religion as the Constitution says we shouldn't with public dollars. I understand, you know, some of their concerns, but their concerns have very little to do with the reality of our children. Uh, because to be very honest with you, I don't think prayer is the, is the enemy of our children or churches. I mean, we need places where kids will learn. We need places that will accept them, that will love them, that will push them, that, that, that will talk to them about a value construct that, that is good for America, that's good for all of us. After being delayed by the courts for over two years, private religious schools were finally allowed to participate in the Milwaukee Parental Choice Program. One such school accepting voucher students is Mesmer High, located on the city's north side. We have 460 students in grades 9 through 12, with about 80% of our students being minority. Over the past 10 years, Mesmer has had a graduation rate of 98%, of which 85% of those students are attending colleges throughout the United States. They teach you more in one day than what you'll learn in a week in public school. Students have high expectations that are set upon them expectations related to their responsibility, such as getting to school on time, conducting themselves like young men and young women, and then responsibility related to academics. All of those things are a part of being a Mesmer student, and it's, it's, a, it's a code that the students live by. I think it's very good that we do have discipline because if we have no discipline, then a lot of students will just do whatever they want to do, like in public schools. About 60% of our families are low income, meaning that they are at or below the federal poverty level. It, it was just hard for me to believe, you know, that uh, my child, uh, Latasha, would be able to uh, get a voucher to go to a private school. They are the same demographic of the children that are in the public schools. The exact same. At Mesmer, you really care because you some most of the kids here are paying to come to Mesmer. So they ain't gonna mess up what they're doing or the scholarships. You're told when you're hired that one of the requirements for this job is to keep up with parents. And you're also told that we understand and you need to understand that must that mean you might have to call from home. Because when do your parents work? Our parents are working parents. They're, they 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 are not sitting at home usually because they can't afford to or they get other circumstances going on. Of course, this happens in the public schools too, but there, it's optional. At Mesmer, it's part of the code, a code that does not include the teachers' union. The unions have not had a direct effect on what we do here. Um, in fact, many teachers that come here to teach do so because they want to be away from that union mentality. Your unions have exceeded their usefulness in some way. They're so desperate to protect the rights that we forget about who we're really serving. The classrooms are much smaller, and that allows me to get one-on-one um, -on -one individual attention from the teachers, especially when I'm having difficulties in a subject. And I also like the religious 
background that they teach? I would say the majority of our students are not Catholic, and this is a Catholic high school. But my theology courses all stem and flow from the Catholic perspective, so I have to, I have to get around whatever their religion is anyway, so I make sure it's very clear that I'm not telling them what to believe. There is no reason why a poor parent should not be able to choose this school. It's in the neighborhood. We're educating the child for half the price of the public school, and the parent wants it. It's the best thing that happened for Cornelius and I. Uh, it's, it's actually the best thing that can happen to any uh, child in high school going to a private high school. I didn't know private school was even this good because I never went myself or applied myself to even think about, like I told you, never even thought about going or my children. I'm a high school dropout number one, and I would have finished school if there had been a choice program. I'm planning on going to UW-Madison, get my law, law degree, because I want to be a lawyer. I'm just so glad to have a happy child. I, I am just really, really so proud to see him walk in with a smile every day. I just thank the Lord. <laughs> and so, that's the picture of a major debate about education in America today. The research tells us we got to change. The traditional public education system says, just wait, just hang on long enough, we'll fix it. But the parents are saying, we can't wait any longer. And that's why more and more communities are introducing competition into the system with charter schools, private scholarships, and vouchers. As I said at the beginning, this is a personal story for me. I wonder about those children who didn't find out their education was lacking until it was too late. I believe for a bright future in America, we need to rescue these children from failing schools and give them a choice. Here's how some look at the future. All signs point to making the kinds of improvements that, that uh, we've all been working uh, to make. Uh, I think we have to keep in mind that the vast majority of schools in this country are really doing a very good job, a very good job and uh, those should be celebrated. And as we celebrate those good success stories, that breeds success. I mean, success breeds success. I think we are seeing programs that actually make a difference for children. And if we can stick with it and hold ourselves accountable and the system accountable, we will see major dramatic improvement for our children in this nation. The voucher movement is spreading. Uh, that, 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 that's a good sign. The resistance is enormous. It may well be that another two generations, we will have brought this country's educational system up to something that could be called mediocrity. If we continue with the present system, I think we will see sporadic improvements in the public school system, which will evaporate over time, and the gradual trend will be towards a continuing decline in the quality of education in this country. But if we find some mechanism of increasing access to competitive market schools, uh, especially for low-income families who currently have no access to these schools, I think we will see the most fantastic transformation in the quality of education and the quality of life of the American people. I think the future of, of choice is going to be a very bright one. I, I believe that we will have choice all over this country simply because it's right. People have decided that they want it, that it's a good thing, and it's going to happen. I think we're getting more honest about the choices kids make and that parents want to make and trying to provide those choices. And in the next decade, we will see a flowering of a new kind and a better kind of public education in this country. And I'm very excited to be part of it. America cannot be a first-rate country with a second-rate educational system. And leaving it to the status quo is simply a recipe for disaster. We've got to change the system. We've got to change it today. And we've got to put the parents in charge. Parents are not going to sit back and take this anymore. We're, you know, we can't watch our kids go to prisons. And, and, and African-American kids, boys, are in big trouble right now. And we can't sit back and watch that happen. I, I predict this is going to be one of the major uh, arguments and debates in the presidential election. And that's going to benefit everybody. Let, every, let the world focus on Milwaukee and see what we're doing here. Let them see these smiling kids who are learning. Let them see the parents who are finally involved and allowed to be involved. And let them see this frustrated public school system chugging along, finally forced to improve the quality of education. The dam is getting ready to break, and it's going to 
overwhelm the country. When you have, if you have any single state, which may be Florida, may be Arizona, may be New Mexico, who knows where it will be, which will introduce a really universal voucher system, the results will prove to be, in my opinion, so dramatic that it will sweep the country. Much of the recent history of American education has been about money, politics, and power. For the sake of our youth, the future of America, will this new millennium bring freedom for all parents to be able to choose the schools that are right for their children? Will the control of our children's education be with government and unions or with parents? I, for one, vote for the parents. I'm Larry Elder, and this is The National Desk. Till next time.